going to read one verse because we're going to look at probably a lot of these verses. But I'll read one verse. John 11, verse 42. That's where we'll start. Reading from New King James. Red letter edition. Jesus is speaking.
thing. Now why what you believe can affect tomorrow, the opposite is also true, because if you know you can't, then you probably won't. Your thinking saying that you can do something or become something also has a negative effect from the perspective that if you don't think you can, if you don't think you are, if you don't think highly of yourself, then you're probably right. Which brings a negative connotation. One of my favorite actors and, and folks, I've talked about a little bit in, in Bible study, and some of y'all, I'm, I'm a little older than some of you, so you may not remember him, but his name was Bruce Lee. Amen. Bruce Lee has some famous lines. One line I love is when some guy tried to impress him and broke a boy. <laughs> Famous line. Right? Yes. Bruce Lee says, one will never get more than he thinks he can get. Amen. You'll never achieve more than what you think is your threshold. What you truly, deeply believe is true about yourself and your future is most likely what will happen, what you believe about yourself. Can I just say this so you understand this message today about getting a life? People have told you things about you and you've believed it. And what you have grown up believing has shaped the way you do things, the way you act and interact with people. And so uh, 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 what do you believe is the question this morning. What is it? that you hang on to. And I know many of you will take the high road and become spiritual with me for the next 40 minutes and say, well, I believe in Jesus. And I think if I took a poll and asked you that question, everybody would say they believe in Jesus. But then I would still ask the question, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Because it's unfortunate in the house of God that while everybody believes in Jesus, everybody believes something different about Jesus. The problem is most people don't have powerful self-belief in themselves, which kind of reflects on what they think about Jesus. Because Jesus always tells us that we are somebody in him. Most people think that this is uh, about as good as life gets. I'm where I am. I'm satisfied. This is it for me. And for the most part, most people believe that the best they can be is merely good. I believe in Jesus, and I'm good with that. But do you understand that Jesus says, I've come to give you life. That's good but I've come to give it more abundantly. And unfortunately, too many people feel it's easier to stay in mediocrity than to undertake the difficult process of upgrading your belief system. I'd rather just be a Christian than a disciple. I wish I could help this. Because being a disciple means now I've got to upgrade, I've got to take what I believe about Jesus to another level. It's easier to relax in the good instead of striving for the great. It's easier to stay medio mediocre than to evolve. Are y'all with me here this morning? And so when he says he wants to give us life and that more abundantly, belief not only shapes my lifestyle, but it determines my eternal destiny. What I believe can make me a better child of God for the future. And so this morning, uh, as we look at this particular text, I think it's important to understand the levels that we are when it comes to our belief system. John chapter 11, very famous text, you know it already. Uh, Jesus was uh, having a retreat with his disciples when the word came 
that his buddy, his friend, his ace, Lazarus, was sick. You know the story. We've heard it back and forth. And uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus, after hearing the word, um, decides to stay put where he is. Can, can I just start by telling you that when it comes to belief, uh, I think you and I need to have an understanding or an explanation of what belief means. Because one of the things that I think the problem is we come into uh, this Christian realm with a, with a belief system or an ideology of what it really means to be a Christian. And so let me start by saying that there's a generalistic belief system. When people say they believe, uh, uh, that they're believers, um, you really can't take that for face value because what they simply mean is that they have a generalistic belief about living. And what does that mean? They, they have what is known as, listen, faith assumptions. And faith assumptions are just things that they call faith but are really based around scientific, of rhythmic deductions. Uh, it's just about the flow of life and things that happen. Well, I just have, you know, where you hear people talk and they'll say, well, I just have faith that everything's going to work out. Are y'all with me here? That faith they're referring to has nothing to do with God. Has nothing to do with Jesus. It's just a faith assumption, a terminology that's used by people once they deduct things. Well, my bills are due and I, and, and I'm, and I need to pay them. But when I look at my checkbook, I see that I get paid this Friday so I can pay that bill. So you know what? I believe everything is going to be all right. It has nothing to do with God. It comes through a deduction. It comes through a scientific, it comes through an algorithm of, of things falling into place. Are y'all with me here this morning? So that's how some people have faith. So when you hear people say, I have faith, I believe, you probably need to go a little deeper. Because then there are some that uh, believe in a general faith because of what they call the frailty of life. And what's the frailty of life? Basically, the frailty of life is simply this, put, life is short. You're not going to live forever. You're not going to be here forever. And so therefore, make sure that you live your life, believe in, uh, if you will, uh, uh, loving someone and having someone love you. So in the case where life ends, there's somebody in your life that can take care of you. So I have a belief system where I'm nice to people so they'll be nice to me. It's a generalistic view because of life. A, a life is short, love somebody, connect with somebody, make sure that there's somebody for you when life ends because life's not going to go forever. That's how some people think. It's a generalistic belief system in living. Are y'all with me here? But now while that's a belief in general living, there's also a belief in spiritual living. There's a belief in spiritual living, which goes beyond, if you will, the, the general deduction or scientific thinking of what people uh, believe. See, at some point, you've got to put down your calculator, shut off your phone, uh, uh, don't be caught up in what's in your bank account, and at some juncture, your belief has to come to uh, a belief in who God is in your life. In other words, he's beyond what you can see, feel, or what's tangible. He's the spiritual power that comes in your life. So to get a life is a matter of belief from a spiritual perspective. Now how does that occur? Well, first it comes through a matter of credibility. And what does that mean, a matter of credibility? Well, uh, 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 when you read uh, John, we're in John chapter 11, but if you read John tw uh, 22, uh, uh, 2 22, it says that they believed in the word of God. Can, can I say this so you understand where I'm going when I say you believe in the word of God, the credibility? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? By the word of God. The only way you're going to build a faith belief system is through the Word of God. If you don't read the Word, what do you believe in? You believe in you. 
You believe in the magazines you read. You believe in other things. But a spiritual belief system can only be built around the credibility of the Word of God. Can I say this to you? How do I increase my faith? Increase my reading. How do I increase my belief system? Increase my intake of God's word. If I'm only going to read God's word every now and then, that will be a reflection on what I believe God can do in my life. So he says there's a credibility of scripture. But then when you read further in John chapter 4 and chapter 6, you find that not only there's a credibility in scripture, but there's a credibility in Christ. Meaning what? He says, if you can't believe me for my word's sake, Believe me for my work's sake. In other words, I start to believe in Jesus based on the experience I had with him. If I know he's healed me, then I believe he's a healer. If I know he's met my need, then I believe he's a financial need supplier. Are y'all with me here? If he's healed my relationship, then I know he's in that as well. So the credibility of Christ becomes evident to the point where you can't make me doubt him. I, my, my foundation is strong. I won't be shook because of who he is. And so my belief system, this, this belief in a spiritual living, is, is really a matter of credibility. Credibility in the scriptures, credibility in Christ, but then it's not only a matter of credibility, but it's a matter of content. In other words, there's some substance to what I believe. Let me go back to my story. And so they came to Jesus and they said, look, your friend has died, but the Bible says he delayed his coming. You know the story. You've read it several times. He delayed his coming. And uh, uh, when he delayed his coming, uh, then he got word that Lazarus had died. First he was sick, then he died. And then after he dies, Jesus decides to go and to go where Lazarus is. So when he shows up, and, and again, I'm not going to belabor you with the story in whole. I want to talk about the belief system more so than anything. When he shows up, we know the story. Martha meets him, right? And Martha's got a little tube with her. Uh, because he's late, brother died, his name was in the program, he was the eulogist, he didn't show up, uh, uh, they even buried him, he didn't do the last rites or the committal to the bad body, and now here come big man Jesus sauntering into town with his entourage like it's a big deal. And, now, and, 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 I, and I read that and I know she was upset because I've seen many a funeral where family members fight over stupid stuff. Y'all with me here? And so he shows up in town and uh, now um, uh, she confronts him. You know the story. She, she confronts him and when she confronts him, um, um, she says, if you, if, I, if you had been here, uh, my brother wouldn't have died. Amen. Right? And, and you know, we, we've always told you and shared with you that when she said it, she said it with an attitude. Mm -hmm. um, um, she said it with almost contempt. You know, like, what are you doing here? Because if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then a dialogue ensues between him, uh, Jesus, and Martha. And, uh, and here's where we kind of get an understanding about this spiritual life because he says, in essence, he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Um, um, well, first he says, your brother will live again. She says, I know that he will live again in the great resurrection. She's trying to be deep with Jesus. And, 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 and many of us try to be deep with Jesus on many occasions. And so um, he says to her, but I'm the resurrection of the life. Right? And then he says, do you believe that? In other words, um, it, it, the, the belief system we talk about from a spiritual perspective is not just a matter of content. Let's see if I can explain what John said. When Jesus says to her, your brother will live again, she quotes um, 
a message. And the message he quotes is, I know that he will rise in the great resurrection. I, I know the, the, the doctrine. I, I know the story. I know what's been taught. I know that he's going to uh, rise in the great resurrection. Jesus turns it from um, not just content, but commitment. And what he does is he says, but I'm the resurrection. Do you believe that? Meaning what? Stop just believing the doctrine. Believe me. In other words, many of us come to church understanding the scriptures but not knowing the word. <laughs> uh, we can quote stuff, but, but our living doesn't align with our quoting. Stay with me. And so now what he says is, he says that this content, this belief is not a vague feeling. I don't come to church to check off the box. I don't come to church because it's the right thing to do. Oh, it's Sunday. And what do you do on Sunday? You go to church. That's not why I'm here. Not that vague feeling. Not that, that, that vagueness. But I'm here because it's not a matter of content. It's a matter of commitment. In other words, I can't wait to get here. And here's why I can't wait to get here. Not so much to see you. I love you. But I come to meet Jesus because I know, as I said, well, you can meet him at home. Yeah, I can, but there's something about the worship in the sanctuary. The Bible brings out that God uh, uh, is in the sanctuary and that when we meet him here, something happens in our lives. And so as he's talking to her, he's referring to himself. Are y'all here with me? In a position of, uh, of, of what? He is, or who he is. Now, see if you can you can catch this a little bit, because he says it's not about the content. Many of us believe in the Bible. Many of us don't follow the Bible. Many of us can quote it, but many of us can't walk it. See, and we've got different sets of belief systems that are in the church, which is why the church pulls on itself because they're going in different directions. And so he says this, he says, so, so that's the belief, uh, a spiritual belief, but then he says, so that's the explanation. But now let's look at an example. Thank you, thank you. Let's look at an example. Because then he says, even when there's an example of belief, many of us are confused. And we're confused about what we believe. And, and, and that's okay from one perspective because if you don't know what you believe, you ought to get some understanding. You, you ought to ask questions. You ought to come to Bible study. You, you ought to take notes and then go over the notes and do your own stuff. Amen. Because here's the point. I mentioned earlier about us just being uh, good and, and, and uh, putting up with mediocre, mediocrity and not going for the great. See, if I have a question, I know I'm going to step on some toes when I say this, but I'm challenging you. If I have a question about the Bible, don't come to the preacher and ask him to explain. <laughs> Until you've looked it up for yourself. Amen. See, in other words, church has become um, entertainment. I come, I sit, and the preacher entertains me. No, you should be growing while the preacher feeds you. And so there's something about the scriptures that aren't clear to me. You know, and back in the day, I would say, more so than today, maybe you would come to the preacher because he had all the libraries. Now you got Google. It's on your phone. It's at your fingertips. So you can easily, I don't understand what that means. Let me go further into this. And dig for yourself. That, that's what really growing means when you begin to feed yourself. Yes. Now, if you still don't understand, then come and ask a question and say, hey, I've been digging in this, I've been looking at this, I haven't really understood this. 
and, and maybe you can shed some light on it. I remember, uh, uh, case in point, Thursday we were looking at um, we were looking at uh, Revelation and the twenty and four elders right on the throne, right? And so I had done my research, and I thought my research was tight. And then on my way to Bible study, I think I was ten minutes from Bible study, my phone rang, and it was a pastor friend of mine. And we were talking about something else. I said, oh, wow, I got you. Let me run something by you. I said, I'm doing this research about uh, the 20 and 4 elders. What you think? And he shared, he said, you got no point. He, was, he started giving me some other insights and stuff. That's what you do. You study for yourself, and then you can get some other perspectives in regards to what you are trying to learn. And so the example of belief is that there's a confusion about belief. Why? And now notice here's the confusion, because people ask these questions. Why did God delay when his friend was in trouble? He was told Lazarus was sick. He was told Lazarus died. He, he delayed before he came. And the question is, why did he delay? And you may ask the question, I got issues, I'm sick, I'm dying, I've got financial problems, and I've been praying. And prayer's not working. God ain't listening. No, no, no. You're confused. God's listening. Delay is not denial. What God is doing is, and he explains it in the text, he says, his sickness. Now, now you've got to hear me this morning, because this, this is a deep one. When we talk, I dare to believe. He was sick. He delayed. Then he died. Prior to that, when he got sick, they said, oh, are we going? He said, no, his sickness is not unto death. But did he die? I'm going to explain it in a minute. Here we go. Well, well, well there's somebody lying. I'm confused. Because you said he wasn't going to die. No, I said his sickness was not unto death. He will live again. But this is what he said. But this is all to the glory of God. Mm. Hear me. We talk about dare to believe. See, we want results when we pray. We want results when we seek God's face. We want results when things are happening and we cry out to God. And God is saying, I hear you. But this ain't going to kill you. It's to the glory of God. I want folks to see what I can do, I want to delay so that you, listen to me, so that all avenues of your success are exhausted. Because I don't want nobody confused about how you were blessed. You hear me this morning. See, the confusion about belief is that if I trust in God, He's going to work it out. And so why did he delay? And then when you read verse 15 of John, it says, how can disaster promote belief? He says, all this is done that you might believe. See, in other words, one of the biggest opportunities for folks to get saved is at a disaster. Just hear me out. When you give an invitation at a funeral, everybody gets saved. Because death now is a reality. Are y'all with me? And so, so, why, for the question, like, why does God allow things to happen? Why does God bring problems? Why does God allow disaster? Because that's an opportunity to promote belief. And here's the other one. Does God always Give me what I want. Martha said to Jesus, here it is, but, but you know all things, so whatever you ask, God will do. Does God do whatever you ask? That's the question. This is the confusion I believe. Well, if I pray, God will answer my prayers. He does answer all prayers. Can I put, write that down? If you ain't taking note, God answers all prayers. You heard it. Pastor Kirk said, God answers all prayers. It just may not be the answer you want to hear. <laughs> Stay with me now. See, he may, you may ask for something, 
He may say, okay, wait a minute, no. But he answers all prayers. So, so there's a confusion about belief. Look at the next part. But then he says, there's more content of belief. Now, I want you all to catch this. Jesus says, and, and, and this, is, this is where you have to dare to believe. Martha comes out mad, quoting, as I mentioned, uh, a doctrine. Well, yeah, we all know in the great resurrection, he's going to get up. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let me, let me clarify. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, now, y'all got to see this. So, and, and, and as I, as I, you know, challenge myself to, to move forward. The Christ we serve is the resurrection of life. No, let me say it a different way. He asked where Lazarus was. Not so he could perform a resurrection, but because he is the resurrection. Still ain't called. In other words, the content of this belief is that nothing in Jesus dies. Even when he was on the cross, he had to give up his ghost. Because <laughs> you can't kill Jesus. He had to commend his spirit. Because you can't get rid of life. The moment you accept Christ into your life, life exudes from you. Are y'all with me here? Now, 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 I read this verse, I've read this verse over and over and over again, and I'm going to read this time. Something clicked for me, and I'm going to read it to you, see if it clicks for you. He says, I, listen, I'm the resurrection and the life. Now watch this. He that believes in me will never die. But he that dies and believes in me will always live. Mm. Wait a minute. If I believe and never die, then how am I going to die and, have, and believe and have life? <laughs> I never saw that. I read that as well. What is he saying? In essence, he's saying that when you come to know Christ from a belief system, there may be an event of death, but you'll live. But if you live in Christ, you ain't got to worry about dying eternally, spiritually. See? We are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. There are some who don't know Jesus. They are the walking dead. They, they, were, they are spiritually dead. But when you come to know Christ, the resurrection, he gives you life to the point where you'll never die. So the content of that, he says, is you got to be clear on what you believe. Because if you don't believe the right thing, you may not be in the safety zone of eternal life. Then he says this. So there's a challenge. He says in verse 26 to Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? That's the challenge to believe, which means what? The last point and this point, here it is. There's a need for personal conviction. He looked at Martha and said, do you believe this? It's one thing to have a general belief. Do you believe it? Do you understand it? Is it your conviction? Some folks aren't convicted about some stuff. Everybody's not on the same belief system. I'm convicted about certain things. Others are not convicted about that. And here's what they say. That's your conviction. That ain't my conviction. No. When it comes to following Christ, we all ought to have the same conviction as regards to living spiritually and holy for Christ. And so he says, you're challenged to have a personal 
conviction. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then the confession of belief, verse 27, he says, is based on the fact and the credibility of what you heard. A belief settled and assured in I have believed. He sends Martha away and he says, go get your sister. Somebody who has a little bit more content, credibility, and connection. Isn't it interesting? Mary, in earlier verses, sat at the feet of Jesus. Now when she sees him, she falls at the feet of Jesus and worships him. Why? Because she has a different belief system than Martha. Martha believed in him, but it was different. She saw him as what he could do. Mary saw him as who he was. And matter of fact, Martha's request was not Mary's request. Well, it wasn't a request. It was a statement. If you hadn't been here, my brother would have died. But the point was, Martha wanted him to be risen, wanted him to live to the point where um, that conversation took place. Mary never said anything about him rising. It was Jesus that said, show me where he is. It is our strong faith belief that motivates the Lord to do things in your life. When you don't have the faith to trust God and believe, then your life becomes stagnant. And things don't happen in your life. But when you, without a shadow of a doubt, believe through the facts and credibility, then you understand what God is able to do. And so watch this as we close. Watch this. He says, so, he says, roll away the stone. You say he's going to get up? Roll away the stone. Where's the continuance here of my belief? Through testing of your faith. See, many of us fail because in our faith, we fail to test. God tells us to do something, we don't do it. He tells us to carry out a command, we do it when we feel like it, but we don't do it at all. In verse 38, he says, roll away the stone. I can imagine him standing around going, what, what's that going to do? He dead. He, he stinking. He's been in there three days. But yet he says, roll away the stone. And then verse 40, he says, if you believe, you'll see. In other words, you'll move from testing to trying. When you see what God can do and trust him, you'll move from testing to trusting to trying. God will do some stuff in your life that will blow your mind. But here's the problem. You've got to dare to believe. How do I get a life? i got to go beyond my comfort zone. got to go beyond what I've been taught, what I've been brought up on and go beyond that and believe with my whole heart. Try it. Just one day, just say, you know what? I don't understand this. I don't see it. Matter of fact, I'm going to add this third one, and I don't like it. But God, I'm going to believe you by faith. And I'm not going to move till you move. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Now, why do you say, well, don't we got to do something? Don't I got to do something in order for God to do something? No. I found in the Bible where he says, stand still and watch God work. Too much stuff going on in our lives where we're not trusting God enough. He's testing us. We won't trust him and we ain't getting no victory in our lives. Dare to believe. Understand that as a part of this Get Life series, your belief system has to change. And are you just satisfied with the norm? Or will you go beyond your comfort level? Juanita got up today and she gave a testimony about time. Some of y'all got excited. Some of y'all looked at her. Yeah, she go again. <laughs> but have you ever tried God? And when I say trying, he says, prove me. 
See, I'm going I'm to step out and prove, I'm done. I'm going to step out and prove God and say it this way. Prove God. Try Him. And if He don't do what He said He's going to do, then don't do it. That don't make sense, Pastor. I got an electric bill. I got a light bill. I got a gas bill. I got a car bill. I got this. I got that. And you want me to give my money to the, to the church. No, I don't want you to give your money to the church. I want you to give your money to the Lord. When I was coming up, I had a, uh, I guess they call it a financial fund manager. American Express had a financial fund manager who handled my money. Let the Lord be your financial fund manager. Let him handle all your other stuff. Give it to him. And then dare to believe. And watch God work. Now, for some of you, I know, I just went right over your head, and you ain't going to hear me. But for others, just think about it. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to prove God. And I'm going to see if what pastor says is really right. And if it ain't right, stand up. Pastor, you lie. God didn't do it. That's how much I believe in who the 